Okay, with this evaluation, it's kind of no need. Everything's perfect. On to the next one. <laughs> Just kidding there, Eric. Um, yeah, but, you know, you solved a lot of these problems that I have been uh, talking about that I struggled with in my own orchestration. So, uh, pitch weight being focused in the upper register of the piano. You introduce some bass elements uh, to kind of break up that um, that range monotony in there. Um, you varied the repetition of the melody enough to um, to make it interesting. When the melodic development soared rather high, you had ways of getting around that. Um, the accompaniment figures were nicely handled. I really like the way that you got the separation between these elements with the uh, for with the first going bump ba ba bum and the second going ba ba bum, I, that that's just that's exactly that's a, just a, just a great way to handle it. Um, and also, uh, like on the next page, as, as we'll look at, you've got that driving staccato transitioning smoothly. You have enough of a change of textural context right in here to um, to keep the upper middle register scoring from feeling too relentless. Okay, so now let's talk about a few of these touches. I, I You know, I'm going to go over this score. <laughs> I'm definitely going to give you your 10 minutes plus. There's a lot to talk about in terms of things that worked really well. And you know, just just talking about, you know, I, I just mentioned how in the some of the basics how you were able to solve some of those uh, some of those evaluation criteria. Just one little comment right in here is that you easily could have scored for three percussionists, right? So just have one person on tambourine, one person on suspended cymbal, and one person on snare drum, right? And then throw in the bass drum later. You didn't have to have one player juggling all of these instruments. I mean, really easy for them to hit the suspended cymbal tish, right, with a stick and then do a little roll on the snare drum and go back and forth. That is no problem at all. Here you've got the accent, excuse me, you've got the staccato mark, so the implication is that they'll be cutting it off with their hand right in there, and that's that's still no problem. And then going to the bass drum later, which was that wonderful little stroke, uh, which I'll mention, in a, you know, it's just the absolute perfect place to put it. So it's a little light on percussion in some ways, but it, it's just exactly enough. I think that, you know, trill, crescendo, piano to forte, I, I think the, the more standard triple beam tremolo mark is a little bit better than the trill mark, frankly speaking. Because here, like, you use it, right? So if you're going to use it here and there and there, yeah, I mean, so like, if this is the thumb trill, it's the same thing, though. It's the same. Yeah, I... yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Maybe you could, maybe you could clarify that in, in your scoring. You know, just like, right? You know, thumb, thumb trill. Is, if people, if people don't know this about the tambourine, um, you can make the shakers. You can, you can make the the um, the instrument vibrate in a way that rattles the shakers, the uh, the little discs inside the tambourine, in a couple different ways. Of course, one is just like with your wrist. You can just uh, you can just vibrate your wrist back and forth very very quickly and get them to rattle. And then another way is to put the thumb on the membrane of the tambourine and then just sort of rub it across in a way that makes the whole instrument kind of shudder. And I, I'm guessing that's what you mean by the trill marking right in here, but I think you should just write, I think you should just mark it like this and then write thumb trill over the top if that's what you intend. All right, just, just, just because like you can't rely on this to give the percussionist the idea that they should do that, even if maybe that's their preference, right? All right, so 
Um, okay, let's move on. Our three trumpets. I'm, I mean, it's scored out. Like, you don't have any... You don't have any heavy brass here on the first page, but it's sort of scored out as if you intended to have a like longer contribution. And it would have been great to hear, you know, to uh, evaluate um, like the full the the full score. Like if you had done done a complete entry, that would have been really amazing to look at. I like the idea of adding the E flat clarinet, of course, sounding high B. So you've got that high B sound doubling with piccolo and flute all on the same note. Now this is going to be fairly weak, uh, so you're just you know your your piccolo player is just basically kind of you know kind of firming up that pitch and there's really nothing that is out of the range of just a standard flute until you get up to this E, right? So, you know, it's just, it's easier to play and it's and it's not going to sound shrieky. Um, you know, there's, and of course it's, it's not the most musical sound to score the high D for, for your flutes. And it's something I avoided as well. Okay, and then, you know, oboe, clarinets, and then, yeah, it, I, you know, it, you end up with a, yeah, when you have the clarinets, the clarinet and E flat above the oboe like that, it, it there's there's an it's sort of an interesting phenomenon. You've got your you've got your sounding G sharp and you've got the sounding B uh, playing thirds above these B fourths in the oboe, and then the B is being doubled by your second clarinet. So it's a very clarinet heavy timbre. There's not a lot of support for the first oboe pitch right in there. That's my only concern. This is one of those cases where I feel that it would have been fine for your second flute player to play this E, even though it's like not the strongest place for the flute, just to give it a little bit of a boost in terms of everything else that's going on. Because I feel like A2, or actually A3 flutes, if you consider the piccolo being on the same note, it really, you know, how can they compete against the uh, the pungency of your E-flat clarinet? Right? Like they, they really can't. So the E-flat clarinet sound is really going to be the dominant color right in here. And that actually just frees up. Like, you, the piccolo doesn't even need to be there at all, right? Because it's kind of weak and it's not going to be heard. So what if you're, um, you know, like, what if there was some way to re-scramble this so that there was more support on this E? That's, that's you know, because there's just so much weight on the Bs. And the first clarinet being in a very optimum spot with a G sharp will come through great, right? But there's, like, but the E is the, a little neglected. Okay. And then you've got these little punches here from your trumpet. I think are really fun. And of course, tambourine, hard to get away from. And then that is just being combined with the uh, with the vi first and second violins. I think that you could have supported your second oboe right in here with second violin. Because all the weight is above, right? The only thing that is below is just the second oboe right in there. I mean, it's, it's, that has its own kind of minimalistic effect. But, yeah. And then, like, the addition of pizzicato to these patterns, I thought that was really nicely done. And the simplicity of what's going on here was really welcome as well. With just little bees popping out here in the piccolo. I thought that that worked great. And then the trumpet just giving it a little push from below. Excellent. Just excellent idea. Very nice... Um, you know, not using too much. And uh, sometimes uh, the intro to a piece like this, kind of laying laying back a little with your scoring, can be good in a way because then you can save the bigger moments for later and it just has a kind of a sprightly beginning that catches the ear. So here, like I was mentioning before, there's, an, there's it's the same, but there's enough variation 
adding this kind of idea here with the uh, the second bassoons, and that's looking ahead to right. It's that part that comes up in uh, section B. So yeah, so that's a nice way of looking forward. And of course, you got this part written in octaves with the bassoons on the bottom and then the French horns sounding an octave higher. Not so sure if you need to do this one, two, three, four kind of thing. I would I would kind of prefer that you scored it out, you know, even if you just have identical things on two say two staves, it's just easier to score read. So yeah, so it's it's there's a lot of weight above the bassoons, but it still works in this context just because everything is nicely placed. You could probably easily do with just um, two horns here rather than all four. Yeah, and then um, your third trumpet pushing up once again to support. You know, there's, there's kind of no need for that third trumpet player to play something that the first trumpet player should be doing. I think this came up in another score. And I think that I would trust... The first player more in this situation, no, you know, no detriment to third horn play, uh, third trumpet players who I've given very, very tasty lines, but ones that were really, really appropriate to the third trumpet player's job of being a support player, right? So, I mean, kind of fun to trade off, but unless like the third trumpet player was on flugelhorn and you wanted some sort of, you know, exposed. Uh, contrasting solo, there's kind of no need for the third to be taking the part, in my opinion. And this is nice, this push right in here from the timpani, and, uh, you know, supporting what's going on in the strings, right? It's kind of giving the strings more teeth right in here in their support role of what's going on here in the clarinets, right? And and then just all of this lovely playing along with the horn, with the trumpets right in here, and the uh, clarinets w working their way down. Uh, just really really fun, really great scoring. Great, um, you know, it's just something that that I did not even consider, and it's really great to see in another part. And that leads us to our little. <laughs> our little section that leads to the next part. And I, I felt that this is one of those things where the chord at the end was so tasty <laughs> and the, you know, that I just, I, I was thinking, oh man, that's just like that. The scoring right in here is the basis of section B. You know, why did you stop? Right. I, I would have loved to see where you went with it. Even if you weren't going to have me evaluate it, it would have been nice to just see it like a, a bar or two. See, not, not that I should encourage people to be adding more than they're supposed to. <laughs> uh, you, you know, typically I would get, you, you know, I've, I've gotten many scores that at, at like the minimum or, or semi-brev level where the, um, where the orchestrator has orchestrated the entire score, right? And, and this is one of the reasons why I open things up to having me evaluate any section, right? So if people wanted to, they could orchestrate the entire thing, but have me look at the last section instead of the first section as, you know, as I'm probably going to start repeating a lot of what I say when I start to, to see a similarity between approaches. And then, yeah, this pizzicato right in here uh, under the, um, under the staccato right in here. I See, I don't feel that this is necessarily the exact approach that Faya would take for this piece, but I feel that it, it really has a strong resonance with some of the strategies, like the overall strategies. I think his his choices of color might be a little different, right? Uh, but but I think that his his particular strategies um, might be very similar, like with pizzicato supporting these eighth notes and so on, quarter notes to eighth notes. And I think that works really, really well. You know, that's that's, you know, would would he have started with oboes, worked his way through to clarinets, and ended up with horns? I I don't know. I I have a feeling that trumpet might have been more involved in that kind of thing. 
But yeah, but such a cool cadence right here. Um, so so nicely scored, and that just little touch of bass drum in there, boom, it's just perfect. <laughs> so thanks again, Eric. Um, you know, you know, I've I've always seen great stuff from you, and it it's just been really exciting to um, to see your contributions and and like and just it just remains for me to thank you for your entry and for your support and thanks to all the Patreon supporters and to the web website subscribers for being a part of this and I just really feel happy to be in the thick of it once again uh, I, I really live for this time of year when I get up every morning and I go down to my studio and turn on my computer and load up another score to take a look at and to talk about. It's just a wonderful time and it's a great way to make it through these winter months. A lot of people think it's summer everywhere all over the world, but here in the southern hemisphere, like South America, Australia, uh, New Zealand, and so on, South Africa, uh, it's winter for us and kind of the dead of winter, really. Um, you know, July through September. Actually, our chickens just started laying eggs. Uh, no, I, don't, I don't know what that has to do with orchestration, but things are starting to slowly warm up. But this is a really great way to bring on the spring. So thank you again, Eric. Thanks, everybody. And now on to the next evaluation. <laughs>